Welcome everyone to Talks at Google. Today it's my pleasure to introduce John McConnell. John McConnell served more than 10 years on the White House staff as a senior speechwriter for President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney. He was part of the three-person team responsible for all of the 43rd president's major addresses, including the speech to the joint session of Congress after September 11 and four State of the Union messages. John is a former resident fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics in the John F. Kennedy School of Government. He is a trustee of Wayland Academy and serves as chairman of the selection committee for the annual Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for distinguished reporting on the presidency. A lifelong political enthusiast, John was a page in the United States Senate under the sponsorship of Senator William Proxmire. He grew up in Bayfield, Wisconsin and is a graduate of Wayland Academy, Carleton College, and Yale Law School. So it's great to have you here, John. Thank you, glad Maybe to be here. Maybe you can start telling us a little bit about your background and how you started working for the president. Sure. Um, the best way uh, to go to work for a president as a speechwriter is to go to work for a governor as a speechwriter and make sure that that governor gets elected president. It's as simple as that. Um, I was very fortunate to, uh, to go to work for George W. Bush down in Austin, Texas, uh, right at the beginning of the year 2000, right as his presidential campaign was, was getting into full gear. Uh, he had two speechwriters on the team there already, Mike Gerson and Matthew Scully, and I had known both of them uh, previously, and we uh, um, uh, joined together as the speechwriting team there at the beginning of 2000. Saw through the entire campaign, uh, the uh, closest election in American history, the historic recount in Florida, and then the short presidential transition between Clinton and Bush, pretty much half the, the normal length because of, the, because of all the litigation in the, in the recount. And then uh, started at the White House on uh, January 20th, 2001, and in my case stayed until the last day. Uh, Mike and Matthew both moved on uh, uh, sometime prior to the to the conclusion, but I stayed uh, stayed the full time. Prior to that, I had uh, worked at the White House uh, for a couple of years for Vice President Dan Quayle in the early 90s, and that was really my first uh, speech writing experience. Um, uh, and then in the interim, I uh, had worked for former Vice President Quayle after he left office uh, for several years, and uh, also wrote speeches for Bob Dole in the 1996 campaign. Traveled around the country with Bob Dole for the last six months of the losing campaign against President Clinton in 96. So 2000 was the first winning campaign I'd ever been on. And from your intro, we saw that you served both as speechwriter to the president and the vice president. Is that something that's common? It's not, and as, as, as far as I know, and I was told that there had never been in the history of the White House someone whose title was speechwriter to the president and vice president. I was a, um, a special assistant and later a deputy assistant to the president, but also an assistant to the vice president. So I had uh, an official title in both offices. And the story there was that I just got to know Dick Cheney during the 2000 campaign, and uh, my colleague Matthew Scully and I had done some speeches for him, including his acceptance speech. And um, uh, at the time of the uh, transition, he, s he said he would like me to be his uh, principal speechwriter. And I said, well, I'll be, I will gladly do that. Got along very well with him. I said, but of course I'm going to keep writing for the president. And he said, oh yeah, there's, there's going to be you know, complete seamless, uh, 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 seamless arrangement between the president and vice president. Not just in speechwriting, but in other, in other fields as well. So I don't think they have done it that way. I don't think Obama and Biden did it that way. I doubt that Trump and Pence do it that way. Uh, uh, there's such great difference between the two, but I honestly don't know. But that, that, as I say, was to my knowledge the first time. So I was always able during that whole eight years, and nine if you include the 2000 campaign, to really be involved in both presidential and vice presidential speeches at all times, uh, which, was, which was fun, interesting, kept me very busy, but, uh, but also just found myself working for not just one, but two people that I really liked. So what does a speechwriter at the White House actually do? Maybe you can walk us through your day-to-day. -day. 
Yeah, um, it's uh, a little bit hard to plan your life. I learned that earlier, early on when you're a speechwriter at the White House. Or actually, I should say it's not hard to plan. You can plan all you want. <laughs> it's, it's easy. Just sit down. Here's my week. It's planned. No problem. And the uh, problem is your plan doesn't survive past lunchtime on Monday. Um, something's going to come up. Some new event is going to come up that requires a, a response from the president or vice president or both. Um, uh, some, some planned event will be changed or dropped from the schedule. Something will be moved up on the schedule, uh, what have you. So um, really, I mean, the typical day, if there is one, it's, it's, it's just making sure you're on top of whatever speech writing assignments you have at the time. And usually there's a pretty strict, um, <coughs> excuse me, pretty strict deadlines, of course, of what you're working on, um, and, and pretty short time frames. Uh, writing a speech for the president, in, in our experience uh, with uh, George W. Bush, in, in general, it was usually ten, four to 10 days to work on a speech. The president gives 500 speeches a year, so there's a lot going on. And when the three of us, Mike, Matthew, and myself, moved up from Austin, uh, we kept doing what we did in Austin. But also, um, uh, Mike, who was the chief speechwriter, hired several other writers to, 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 to just fill in um, uh, uh, the gaps in, in, uh, uh, in you know, the remaining amount of work that there was. We still had editorial responsibilities for everything and, and, and frontline responsibility for all of the, all of the major addresses. Uh, but we did have a larger team. It was smaller than the team that, that we replaced, um, but uh, still, still a good, a good sized team, six, seven writers at the most for president and vice president. A couple of researchers, a couple of fact checkers. So the speech writing, of pres an event gets put on the president's schedule. Okay, it's a major policy address. He's going to be speaking to um, uh, the American Legion or he's going to be speaking to the uh, Chicago Economic Club, or he's going to be speaking to uh, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, or, or, or the Cedar Rapids, Iowa Chamber of Commerce, or a Republican Party dinner in Kentucky, uh, just, just an endless, endless, or a town hall in Manhattan, Kansas, so just an endless array of things that the president is going to do. Uh, uh, and so uh, you get the assignment. A writer is put on it. If um, if we if the if the core team was working on it, we wrote together with literally at the same computer at the same screen with one keyboard in the same room, starting with nothing, and would work on it on that basis. Uh, the other writers on the team didn't work that way. They would they would do their draft and then send it in to Mike Gerson, and then and then um, we would sit down and go through it and, and make sure it had unity of voice. Uh, uh, with the president's prior speeches and the way he liked things. Uh, um, the uh, uh, policy people whose main res you know, area of responsibility was involved in the speech, they would give us the information that we needed. I mean, they, they would say, okay, the president's giving a major speech on Social Security policy. We didn't have to think of what the Social Security policy was. Good thing, because we were, we were not experts in anything, although my colleagues were pretty sharp. Um, but we would get the general policy, and it was then our job to put it in the president's voice and to put it in a, in, a, in a reasonably economical and persuasive speech that wasn't too long, wasn't too detailed, but also wasn't too simple, all of the basic rules you want to follow as speechwriters. And then uh, we would have researchers um, <clears throat> uh, kind of look into background. Where's the president speaking? Um, is there something about the place that he is speaking that will be of interest. Now, there will be some basics. So he, he's going to want to know who he should, should thank and acknowledge, say something about the place that he, the city he's in, uh, what have you. And then, I believe we were the first White House, fact, or White House speech writing office that had this. We had a fact checking division within speech writing. And they were so good that um, other people in the White House started using them. And, Mike Gerson had to say, look, this is not the White House fact-checking office. This is the White House speech writing department's fact-checking division. Uh, but they were very good. And, um, 
they kept us out of a lot of trouble um, because um, you know when you're just when you're churning through these speeches, and you just you, I mean you're doing your very best to, to be faithful to not just the information that you have, but the historical references you might be making from your memory. Um, but the fact checkers would always would always run these things down, um, and then when the and then when the draft was ready, sometimes during the fact checking process. Um, uh, it would be circulated to the chief of staff and then the department heads, the senior White House staff. And there, there would be a cover page attached to a, a copy of the draft, cover page memo <coughs> from a person known as the staff secretary. So he was a very important person in the, in the government of the United States because she is the person who controls the flow of paper to the president and from the president. You want to give something to the president, you don't just wait till you see him in the hallway and slip it to him. You have to give it to the staff secretary. And it's mainly, I think, for e efficiency, for um, record keeping purposes, for sure. And because it's been done that way for many, many years. Um, my understanding is that going back to Eisenhower, they've had this process in the White House, and it's literally called staffing, where, um, uh, the, by which the whole purpose is that when something gets to the president, it has been reviewed by the people who need to review it so that the president can have confidence in it. We wouldn't send a draft speech to the president that hadn't been fact-checked. We just wouldn't do it. And I don't think the staff secretary would let us because the staff secretary would ask, I'm thinking of Harriet Myers, who was the staff secretary at the beginning, she would ask for the annotated version. You know, where, where's the fact-checked version of the speech? Because if the president has any questions, we can only have answers if we have, you know, if, if whenever there's a, a, a verifiable assertion in a speech, um, uh, it was the responsibility of the fact checkers to drop a footnote explaining where that, where that came from. And so um, when the president would get a speech, he could be confident that, okay, he, he never had to say, okay, this is a major address on foreign policy, for example. The president never had to say, well, has this been reviewed by the National Security Council? The answer would always be, he didn't have to ask that question. Condi Rice would have seen it, uh, or, or her top deputy would have, would have seen it and, and it, and, and, and it would have passed through them. And they, they might have made changes, um, but um, the president didn't have to, know blow by blow what happened in the process. He just need to know that it went through the process. And that's why if you ever had a typo or anything, by, by the time it reached the president, a typo would have gotten through a lot of people. Do you know and, if that process continues today? I'm guessing it does. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the speech process is in the White House now. I'd be interested in knowing, but I just don't know. Um, but if I had to guess, I would, I would guess that when, when, some, when a document got to the president, uh, it, it had gone through staffing. It's just such an efficient way of doing things. Uh, one, one, one thing I remember thinking when I was learning about all these, uh, about these uh, uh, processes um, and, and methods, uh, I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. Let's suppose I read something this weekend, an article in you know, the New York Times Magazine or something that I follow online and read it and found it very interesting and just think, well, I know the president would be interested in this. And if he didn't see it, I, I'd, I'd like for him to see it. Well, um, I would think, well, okay, okay, I'll give this to the president. I'll give this to the president's secretary and she'll, she'll give it to him. Well, what if seven people on the White House staff had the same thought? And all seven of them gave this article to the president's secretary or somebody and said, will you give this to him? There's this pile of paper. Or if you just give it to the staff secretary, the staff secretary might, might I'm guessing in a case like that, if seven people said, I'd like to make sure the president saw this, there's a memo to the president attached as an article and the following seven people mm -hmm. suggested that you look at it. So it's very streamlined and everything else. I also noticed at the White House, when you would get a document back, uh, from the president, it would be stamped. It would, it would be a, they have a stamp that says the president has seen, um, and that goes into record keeping. So they, 
They, it's part of the Presidential Records Act. I'm sure that uh, if the president has seen or had something in his possession, they need a record of that. Mm -hmm. So it's all, it's all very, very efficient. Made our job easier uh, in, in a lot of ways because uh, the staffing process, you know, they, they had to turn things around pretty fast and get them to the speechwriters. The, the cover memo would say copy, or, uh, uh, comments due in the speechwriting office at 5 p.m. today. Mm -hmm. They never had more than a day or so. They really didn't. Because we had, you know, we had to get that thing ready and, and, and approved. Um, if it was a foreign trip that the president was going to be speaking on, we had to get everything, everything he was going to say for those 10, a week or 10 days prepared and done and approved and in a book before Air Force One took off. Well, what was the difference between writing for the president and writing for the president when he was a presidential candidate? Um, the, the, the main difference uh, was, uh, you know, in, in the specific case of, of George W. Bush, I noticed that, that when, when, I, when I was first working for him as governor uh, and, then, and then as time went on uh, into his presidency and into his second term and to the end, he, he, um, he became a, a, a much more active editor. Uh, he, he was a pretty good writer in his own right, but not that he had a heck of a lot of time to sit down and write things. Um, but um, he, he never sort of let up on the, on the speech writers or the speech writing process. He never kind of laid off, even, even after years had gone by. He still, if anything, he was more demanding as time went on because he, he got, got more sure of himself and how he wanted to put things and, and, uh, and also um, uh, comfortable with with the standards that, uh, that a president is entitled to expect. Um, but if you speak in general about the difference between running for a president and presidential candidate, um, the main one is, is, of course, the fact that in a campaign, it's all about sharp contrasts. It's, it's uh, not just vote for me, it is make sure not to vote for my opponent. Um, and these can be put in in uh, rough terms, or they can be put in gentler terms, and we've we've seen both kinds, and we've seen much in the range between the two. Um, uh, also, you're in campaigns, you're 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 expressing aspirations, you're expressing um, the hope that you will be put in a position to be able to do things. You can say things like, uh, "I I will I will instruct uh, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs to carry out." a new policy of review of the veterans' hospitals or whatever else, and, you, and that's how you write it in the speech. But when you're writing for the president, you say, I have instructed the Secretary of Veterans Affairs to carry out this policy. Suddenly, you're doing, th you're doing things. You have that power, and, and uh, the president can speak for the nation um, with, with, without any fear of, of, of uh, contradiction or, or seeming presumptuous. A candidate can't do that. Um, campaigns are by their nature divisive, um, and uh, so you've got debates, you've got, you've got, you're in a context where ads are being run, uh, um, uh, arguments are being played out on TV, uh, very high stakes um, meetings between the, the, the presidential candidates, uh, and the pressure builds, uh, and, and as the election draws near, the speeches tend to get tougher, and the definition of the choice tends to get sharper, and the expression of feeling and intensity of feeling about what's at stake in this election, uh, uh, you know, gets gets stronger. And writing for a president, again, the contrast, you're, you're, it's much more about unity. It's much more about appealing to uh, a, a far broader. Uh, um, uh, uh, a section of the of the not just of the country but of Congress. I mean, you want everybody's vote when you're running, so it's not not as if you're not speaking to the whole country. But by the same token, um, when you're president, you want to get things done. It's not going to be quite so much about um, you know the the, the wrongheadedness of your adversaries. It's going to be it's going to be if you're going to be successful, I think, you know, far greater attempts to find common ground and, and not be as, as divisive as the rhetoric of a campaign with regards its nature to can be national speeches how did you manage to be able to connect with people across 
all 50 states because we have people that have different backgrounds, different needs. How did you make that connection in a way that was genuine? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, and I, I think the, the answer is you just keep it at, a, uh, you know, you, because of the diversity you mentioned, you just have to keep it at a, a very general level um, and, uh, you know, try to make the appeal as broad as you possibly can. Not, not that it's so general as, as to be is to be incoherent, although politicians have done that at times. You, you hear them, you hear them uh, make a pitch and you, uh, you have to think, well, what exactly is he talking about? Or what exactly is he trying to get people to uh, agree to? Sometimes uh, the Italians have a phrase, selling air. <laughs> and sometimes you hear that in the political context. Um, but I always, I always uh, when I think in those terms, I think about Ronald Reagan, who always assumed an intelligent listener and he assumed that, not necessarily that the person was agreeing with him, and not necessarily that the person was disagreeing with him, but that the person was open-minded enough to listen to him, and therefore persuadable. Uh, and, and so I always kept that kind of ideal in front of me when I was thinking about um, um, an issue uh, that I had to write, uh, write, write persuasively on. Mm -hmm. And you were at the White House right in the middle of September 11. What was that experience like? Well, that was the day everything changed, of course, and, and we had just gone through uh, the first summer of the presidency, and um, uh, it was uh, uh, kind of a typical week. The president was, was traveling, the vice president was at the White House, and um, I remember my colleague, Matthew Scully, who I spent so much time writing with, and. and right with now uh, in the private sector. Uh, he and I spent all of Monday, September the 10th, working on a speech for the president uh, for that Friday. And I looked at my calendar at the end of the day, and, and uh, I was getting ready to go home. And I thought, ooh, the vice president has a speech Friday for two, and I haven't really done much thinking about that. Um, and I better check with him about what he would like to say. So I called the Vice President's secretary and asked if I could meet with him the next morning, the 11th. And she told me to come in first thing in the morning, and, and I did. Um, and um, when I went to see him and I was waiting outside his door, uh, he was finishing up a, a brief meeting uh, beforehand. I got there about 8.30. That's when I thought I was going to see him. Waited for a while, and by, while I was waiting for him, we received word that, that the first plane had hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. And um, um, while I was still waiting for the Vice President and the TV was on and we were looking at it, that's when the Secret Service man standing outside the door got word that it was a, um, a commercial jet that had, had hit the World Trade Center. And the, the, the instant feeling in the room was you know, just this uneasy sense that it probably wasn't an accident. Um, and then within a minute or two, Vice President motioned me to come into his office, and I went into his office, and the, um, the TV was on, and it was, of course, on, on New York and the, and the Burning Tower. And uh, I just said, oh, sir, I just want to talk to you about the speech for Friday. And he said, yeah, sit down. And, uh, but um, we really didn't talk. We just sat there looking at his television. And um, while we were watching it, the second plane hit the South Tower, and that was the moment that it was obvious to, to everybody, everybody watching that it, it was a coordinated attack on the country. Um, and within, you know, within a few minutes, Condi Rice was in there, Josh Bolton, the deputy chief of staff, uh, a couple other senior people, um, and um, the uh, vice president spoke to the president on the phone a couple times, and I was in there. But no one was looking over to me asking for my advice about what should be done. And, and I, and I uh, told the story many times. I, I, I thought, well, I, whatever I was here to talk to the vice president about is not going to be important anymore. There's not going to be a speech on Friday by the vice president uh, in any way connected with what I was there to talk to him about. So I left and um, went back to my office. And, uh, this is, the, this is the very time that they discovered that a plane was coming at the White House at 500 miles an hour. And that's when the vice president was evacuated in a very intense 
uh, scene, a very rushed scene where he was taken down into a bunker, which is somewhere under the 18 acres of the White House complex, um, because the, the the plane was coming directly, almost directly north of the White House, or, or um, I should say, east of the White House. Um, and that's the one that hit the Pentagon. And if you look at a, a map of Washington, D.C., um, the Pentagon and the White House almost perfectly line up. I always thought of the Pentagon as being way, I guess, east of the White House, but it really isn't. Um, and, um, and if you've ever flown into Washington and you look for the White House, it's the last thing you can find. You can see the Capitol, you can see the Lincoln Memorial, you can see the Washington Monument. But the White House is just really hard to find. It's, it's not the tallest building in its neighborhood. Uh, by any stretch, there's hotels nearby that are that are taller than the White House. You just can't find it, unless you really know the city and know where it is. And so I I don't know what happened on that plane, but but maybe they just couldn't find it, and then hit the Pentagon. I, I just I just don't know. Um, but but anyway, it was it was coming at the White House, and uh, that's when I called my mom in northern Wisconsin to reassure her that everything was fine, and she's the one who told me to get out of the White House because she'd heard on television that there was an evacuation going on, and I didn't know about it. Um, so I went out and joined the evacuation. Um, and uh, as, I, as I went out with this throng of, of staff, I remember one of the uniformed Secret Service officers said, everybody run, there's a plane coming at us. And I, I don't remember running, but I, I do remember seeing a plane north of the White House over 16th Street and thinking that that was, that was a plane that was about to hit the White House and destroy the White House and kill everybody on board. And I remember that as the most, you know, that, that was a, the, the most uh, um, uh, genuinely shocking feeling that I had had all day because I hadn't, you know, the evacuation, I just, as I say, just kind of found out about it. There wasn't this the moment of shock, you know, other than seeing that plane hit the the um, the South Tower on, on TV. Of course, was just seeing that plane and being convinced I'm watching a plane that is about to destroy the White House. Um, it was not. Uh, the, the, at that point, the Pentagon had already been hit. So what I saw was either a military plane or a commercial jet that had been diverted. I I, I never I never found out. Uh, what, what that was. But um, people were wandering the streets, uh, White House staff, and I thought, well, I'm a speechwriter. I better not go home. <laughs> um, they're probably going to need some help from the speechwriters today. Then I just, another, there was no evacuation plan or anything else. Nothing like this had ever happened. So I, I just remember <laughs> seeing another staff guy in the street um, who worked in the office administ administration, and he said, go to the uh, Daimler Chrysler headquarters on I Street because uh, Mrs. Bush's chief of staff's husband worked over there and just sent word if there's any White House staff, you know, looking for a place to gather, please come here. And so that's where we gathered um, and I uh, worked there uh, with Mike Gerson, or I'm sorry, with, with Matthew Scully um, and a couple of our colleagues, David Frum and Matt Reese were there uh, and we were on a speaker phone with Mike Gerson. And Mike had been driving into the White House, and he was on Highway 395 going in from Alexandria, Virginia, toward the White House, and he saw the plane that hit the Pentagon. He didn't witness the impact, but he saw the plane a, a moment before and, and never made it into Washington. They, they diverted all the traffic. And, um, we did a draft speech for the president um, that, for that night, uh, but really that project became the work of Karen Hughes, his senior counselor who had been with him the whole time that he was governor and had now moved to Washington with him. And really the speech that night was, was Karen's work. And, um, and then right after that, uh, of course, Wednesday morning, the 12th, we saw the president, uh, Mike and Matthew and I were in there with him. And, um, and of course we knew that, that we were gonna have some very big assignments quite soon. One of them is to write a, a speech for memorial service at the National Cathedral, um, which was going to be that Friday. Um, so that was a very quick turnaround speech. And that was, a, that was where Billy Graham preached. And there were uh, five presidents of the United States sitting in the front pew. Um, and then on Monday morning, the 17th, 
we got word that the President was very likely going to address Congress on Thursday the 21st. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the quickest turnaround of a major address we ever had. That was a draft of a speech to Congress which would be given to the largest audience in human history, and they wanted that draft in one day. <laughs> and we did it. We didn't have a conclusion, but we, <laughs> we, we drafted the speech. But the President called us in and, and gave us basically the organization of the speech by saying, Americans have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, who attacked our country? Why do they hate us? How do we fight and win the war? Um, and, and, and et cetera. And, and that's, that was pretty much the organizing principle of the speech, the questions that Americans had. Mm -hmm. In general, how did the president prepare for his speeches? President Bush, um, he, really, he, he really prepared. He would read things through. He would make his edits. Um, and sometimes he would call the writer, or he would give the edits to the, to the staff secretary, uh, and the staff secretary would pass them along. Or, um, or sometimes he would call Mike Gerson, and Mike would bring, 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 bring them into the team. Um, but then when he had the final draft, it was, if it was a major, major uh, event, like the State of the Union, which is a, the, the speech that the speechwriters hate most because it's so huge and so unwieldy, and, and it has so much. It has, it, has to, it has to cover so many bases that you, you, um, you know, if, if you write 25 transitions in one speech, you usually have three, three or four transitions. Um, but a speech like that, you have to cover so many different topics. And so that's a tough one. And also, the, 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 the delivered draft of the State of the Union is draft 30. <laughs> um, and, and so it's an endless uh, process. And it is also one of about 20 speeches the president gives in January. So it's not like you have a reprieve from everything else. Um, uh, but uh, so um, uh, with, to answer the question, when the president would have a State of the Union, we would do a heavy outline for him around Christmas time, and then he would react to it. And the outline would be based on the policy input that had been generated over the Pre preceding few months, okay, what's he going to talk about in the State of the Union? What's going to be the program for the, for the year just begun? Um, and then we would sit down and, and do the first draft, uh, and, then, um, and then that would go through a, a very small, uh, um, a, frag a fraction of the ordinary staffing process, just a few of the very top people, the vice president, a few others. And then you would go for the second draft, and, and uh, and then it would be a slightly broader, or broader uh, staffing. And then you'd get it to the president, and then the president, I remember he would, that's when we would go and sit in the Oval Office, and he would sit back in his chair and read that speech aloud. Um, and uh, throughout the State of the Union process, you, that, that's, that's when I would see the president the most, more than any other speech um, in, in general, that's true. Uh, because he would practice it. There would be formal, there's a movie theater in the White House about a third of the width of this room, about as deep, uh, with a curtains and, a, and a, a movie screen and movie theater scening. And that's where he would practice these big speeches. Uh, and if you were involved in the speech, you, you were expected to, to be there uh, during, the, during the practice. Uh, and, and so they'd set up the lectern and the teleprompter, and he would read things through and edit there. Um, so that was a very elaborate, involved process. He did the same thing with the address to Congress after 9-11. It just was very telescoped, right? It all happened within a space of two, three days. Um, and then for the, for the typical speech, uh, with, he didn't use a teleprompter probably more than 10 times a year. President Obama used it, I mean, 10 times a week. Um, and, um, he just, and Reagan used it a lot more than, than uh, George W. Bush did. But, uh, if it was a non-teleprompter event, which is the typical case, he would, he would read it aloud. He would underline things. He would practice it. Um, he uh, would edit up until the very end. Not edit in the sense that he would call the speechwriter if he wanted one word changed on page four. You know, sometimes he would just scribble that in or make a couple notes to himself at the top. But I always, I always uh, I have told people, uh, uh, people I have worked for, uh, who do public speaking in the private sector now, um, in some cases don't think they're very good at it. And, and I often remind them that uh, not everybody's good at it, but 
you can be if you, if you work at it. And I always say the president, the president got better at it uh, over his career. I think he would, I think he would say, and I certainly would say it, um, because he practiced. He wanted it to, he wanted it to sound good. Um, we would read our speeches aloud before we sent them into him because we didn't, you never know, you can, you, you can think you know how it's going to sound, but you don't until you hear it. Uh, and so we would, we would read these things aloud to make sure it had the right rhythms, that, that some words are not good speech words, and so you want to keep them out. But sometimes writers let them slip in. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, you just get a feel for, uh, you know, you don't want something to rhyme. <laughs> um, and that, I remember we discovered that once in one of our read-throughs, something rhymed. And that was a, you know, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't want that. Um, and, um, and then, you know, in, in the president's case, the vice president too, vice president wore glasses. President wore glasses sometimes, but not when he was giving speeches. And so the speeches were in big type, so he could read it without his glasses. Um, and uh, I, I will just say that I, I talked to a guy who worked for Ronald Reagan. Actually, I met the guy, but he didn't tell me this story. The story came to me secondhand that he was with Reagan on this campaign plane in 1980. And um, he said that uh, Reagan was going over a speech very carefully on the way to, this, to the next city. And, and Reagan didn't, and the, and the guy tried to interrupt Reagan. And, and Reagan was kind of annoyed and kind of held him, held him off, not now. And his initial thought was, He's give this speech four times a day. Why does he need to sit here and go over this and practice? And he realized that, that Reagan really wanted the next one to be great. Even if he was reading the same speech, he wanted it to be a great event. So he needed to get into the moment. And so that's another thing I would remind people. There's, there's no such thing as over-preparing. There is such thing as over-editing. Uh, we've all seen that when, when a document is just a... Um, I remember Karen Hughes said about a one of the State of the Union drafts we had done. Um, it, this, this particular year, we had done it a little bit early, earlier than, than was customary. And by the time the event came, I remember there were, there were people editing their own edits, <laughs> uh, making suggested language changes on things they had forgotten they had changed themselves. Um, and, and Karen Hughes said, this thing's, this thing's been floating around a little too long. Um, and so you have to avoid that. Over-editing is, is a real phenomenon because you run into people who, who think new is better than good. Um, and that is not always the case. But it feels fresh because it's new. Um, and and that, can be, that can be dangerous. But over-preparing, uh, in, in terms of get, getting up and, and, and reading a speech, I don't think I can think of as an, I don't think I can imagine an example of someone over preparing. Yeah, that's really helpful because I think even here at Google, <clears throat> there's a lot of opportunities where public speaking can be relevant, whether it's giving a presentation to your team or speaking at the I/O conference that we just had last week. So, with regards to over preparing, do you think that it's better to sort of just write a few notes and then improvise the rest of your speech, or have a full speech written out and then try to go from there? It can be done both ways. I've done it both ways myself. The first question you need to ask yourself is, how long am I expected to speak? Um, that is a big variable. If they just say, you're going to get an hour of time, and you can come in and talk about whatever you want, everyone's excited to hear what you have to say about anything that's on your mind. Those are the greatest events, because <laughs> you're ready now. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> On the assumption that those are rare, um, uh, um, if you have five minutes, my advice is write out every word you want to say. Um, do the word count, and if it's at 750 words, you're, you cannot go any longer than that. Get to 750 words. If you can get that in the five-minute window, you know, you're speaking 150 words a minute, um, and that's pretty fast. Uh, you should aim for 100 to 120, something like that. It's 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 hard to, it's hard to predict because you don't you don't know if there's variables such as audience reaction, you know how how fast someone is it speaks and, and 
and, and, and you know, other individual factors like that. But the important thing is, if it's a small window of time, I, I had a private sector client uh, come, come, uh, uh, come to me a few years ago, and my colleague, Matthew, um, this guy just couldn't get his message across in less than 45 minutes. But he wanted to, and he wanted anybody like to speak from notes. And, and he, he realized that he could never speak from notes and come in, clock in under 45 minutes. And so they sent us videos and transcripts of some of his 45-minute speeches. And, the, and our assignment was write a 20-minute speech that makes all these points. And so we did. And then our only advice to the guy was read this. Get comfortable with it. Get so comfortable with it that you've almost got it memorized. But keep it in front of you. Because that's a position of real comfort on the platform is when you've got it in front of you, every word, but you don't have to look at it. Because you don't have to be nervous about forgetting, about, about something throwing you off, um, which has happened to people who've tried to memorize speeches and it just kind of, kind of fell apart. Uh, but just get, get really conversant and comfortable with that speech and have it with you and people will ver be very impressed because you will have a very uh, economical and polished presentation that comes in uh, within the window that's given you. Now, um, that's the extreme case. And the speaking from notes is always very good as long as, uh, as, long as you are very comfortable with, um, with the timing. I remember one of my great friends I got to know just through this work, his, name's, his name was George Elsey, and I looked him up when I moved to Washington in 2000. And George had been a military aide to President Franklin Roosevelt during the war. And then he was a speechwriter for President Truman, his whole presidency, he traveled around the country with Truman. And um, he just was a wise, a wise old gentleman and wonderful to talk to. Uh, and he died at age 98 about a year and a half ago. Um, there's a, there's a, there have been a lot of speechwriters who've been a long time, so I'm happy to say. Um, <laughs> but I was going to give a speech to a group of cadets uh, in a military school. and. And I knew what I wanted to talk about. I had a little history I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to relate it to their experience. And I really, I was going to speak from notes, and I had 10 minutes. So, and this is about, it was about 10 years ago, and I called George, and I said, George, you're, you're just going to love this. I want to tell you about a speech I'm going to give. And he said, okay. And, and um, so I, I said, I didn't give him the speech. I read through my notes. I said, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, and then I'm going to say thus and so. So I didn't give him the speech, but just gave him the map of what I was going to be talking, uh, talking about. And, um, and he listened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He didn't interrupt. And I got to the end of it, and he said, he said, oh, that's, that's, that's all very good. That's all very good. He said, you know the trouble, don't you? And I said, what? He said, you've got material there for two speeches, and they've asked you to give one. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, you got two, two right there. And, and I started going through it, and he was right. He was right. When I, when I sort of looked at my notes, okay, now I know what we're going to talk about. Now I'm, going to, now I'm going to just sit here with my notes in the quiet of my office and kind of look over at the wall and at my notes and pretend I'm giving this speech. It really went on, you know, 50% too long. Mm -hmm. So that's when I had to ruthlessly cut. So it's okay to speak from notes, but it's really important uh, to know precisely how you're going to start, precisely how you're going to end, and then how, how you're going to fill the time. I always, I always say as well that even with, with uh, uh, experienced speakers, sometimes they lose track of the, of the, of the time. And uh, not completely lose track, but you know, eight minutes in, and they realize they've only got two minutes left instead of their, you know, they thought they're just farther along in their, in their window of time than they thought they were. You can save yourself by just knowing in advance how this thing ends, because you can always race to your, you can always race to your conclusion. And you can, you, can, you can say, I didn't get to cover this last point as much as I would like. If someone would like me to elaborate during the q and I'd be happy to. But I really want to close on this thought, mm -hmm. and, then you're, and then you're home free. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, the, the most painful ones to see are the ones who don't know how they're going to end. Uh -huh. And so you can feel them circling the target. <laughs>
but they just don't know where. <laughs> they don't know where to drop the munition. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to get to my last question before our Q&A session, <laughs> okay. which is, what do you think about Trump's speeches? Um, yeah, I, I was interested to watch uh, Trump develop as a speaker during the campaign. Um, it was, I, I'm quite certain this is the only campaign in, in definitely in the television age where you could get basically every, every network that was broadcasting news live go with that candidate knowing in advance that that candidate didn't have a speech in front of him. Um, it, was, it was just him and he spoke from notes. And he started toward the end of the campaign, I guess, reading speeches, but he sure didn't do that very much. And um, um, I, I, I was really struck during the campaign at how, how far, I mean, he, he got all the way to the nomination, basically, without reading speeches. Nobody has done that in our lifetimes until him. And uh, now, of course, he's reading a lot more speeches, and they, uh, as I said before, I don't know what the process is, but whatever it is, it, it works for them. And uh, uh, the speech to Congress, I thought he sounded very much like a president. I, I, there was so much commentary beforehand. Well, what's this going to be like? Is he going to come in and pull some notes out of it, <laughs> throw it on the rostrum with the assembled Congress of the United States and the Supreme Court sitting there, the diplomatic corps, the joint chiefs of staff, you know, the whole nation watching? But uh, no, he, he, didn't, he did not treat that casually. It sounded like a president. Uh, but um, I, um, I used to love to, when I would sit down with my friend George Elsey, who had written for Truman, all he wanted to talk about was what I was doing. And my interest was in pulling information about, uh, from him about what happened in the 1940s. And I said, George, all you want to talk about is the 43rd president. All, well, all I want to talk about is the 33rd president. Well, thank you so much. So you now bet. we can go into our Q&A session. Thanks for coming. Uh, any advice on ums and ahs? And also, if you detect you're starting to lose your audience or something like that, you see eyes glazing over, any way to you know, re-navigate on the fly while giving a speech? Um, OK, there was your um. <laughs> um you, just ha you, you really have to um, uh, uh, not become self-conscious. Just be yourself. Uh, it's going to happen when you're speaking from notes uh, just off the cuff. You um, have to uh, listen to yourself. Uh, I remember reading that Richard Nixon did not ever watch himself on TV because he was afraid of becoming self-conscious. And this happens. This happens to people. But by, uh, on the other hand, I, I have to guess that John Kennedy did watch himself. And this was a person who really, at the dawn of the television age, became very, very adept at that. I would like to know, I would be interested in knowing what other presidents uh, did, what other uh, uh, successful candidates for lesser offices did. Reagan, there was a story somewhere about Reagan. He was in the Oval Office, uh, and he was so comfortable with cameras, right? He'd been a a movie actor for 30 years and a broadcaster and had and, and, and also done live TV uh, in, his, uh, in his 40s, which was a pretty fairly new venue. When Ronald Reagan was 40 years old, live TV was just really hitting it. Anyway, Reagan is preparing for his, uh, to give a speech to the nation and there's a monitor and he always, the monitor was facing him so that he could see what the camera saw and he would glance over at it. Uh, he wouldn't look at it during his speech, but he would. this was part of his preparation. The monitor would come on. He knew he was about to go live, and he was prepared. And, and the story was that he was at his desk, and he's got his speech, and the lights are on, and he's looking at the camera. He's familiar, but he's looking over at the monitor. There's nothing on there. And, um, and he's just kind of looking over. The monitor's black, nothing. Uh, the time is ticking away. Finally, it comes on, and Reagan sees, sees himself on the monitor live, and he goes, oh, there he is. <laughs> um, you have to, you, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with being, being sort of aware 
of how you look and how you sound, and I think this is how the best, if Reagan was one of the best, uh, become good. So if a person is really, really concerned about, about verbal tics or whatever, I guess the advice I would give would be to, uh, to watch themselves some more. And then the second part of your question um, about losing an audience, uh, there's many ways uh, for people to do it, but, but really, uh, even, even the most polished speaker is gonna lose their audience after about 20 minutes of a speech. Even your best friends are gonna start to go, when is this gonna end? Um, you really don't need to, to, to take it that much longer. You know, that is a prepared speech. Unless you, you have, unless it's so obvious you have so much ground to cover. Uh, so, but to pull people back, uh, uh, humor is always the best way to do it. Uh, but that has to be something very, uh, something, something very genuine and something, uh, the timing is everything. Um, it's hard to, hard to give advice in the abstract, but the best advice is just end the thing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I expect that many Americans don't watch all speeches in their entirety, but rather will see some portions of the speech as highlighted by the media. And as a speechwriter, how does one identify what those hits will be as opposed to the entire album in advance, right? like focusing on periods? <laughs> yeah, that's hard to do. I, I can't tell you how many times when we were, when we were writing these speeches, we would, we would put something together and think, okay, now that is gonna be the signature line of this speech, and get it wrong. It just wouldn't happen. Um, difficult to predict. I mean, sometimes you can nail it, and just know that something is going to uh, uh, get attention. Uh, and unfortunately, in today's political culture, if it's something with kind of a hard edge, if it's something that is making fun of an adversary or something, you know, if it, if it just is kind of personal and is, is interpreted by the media as an attack requiring a reply, it will always be picked up. But, you know, in, in, in my case, I worked for President Bush, he, he didn't want to do too much of that, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, it's, it's hard to do. You keep striving for it, but it, it's, it's hard to predict. I, I always felt like the reporters Sometimes they would have their story half written before the speech was done because they would be given the speech in advance. And, and sometimes you need to hear it in order to realize what were the lines that had the best impact and what were the lines that really drove the argument home. Whereas it, it just reading it real quickly to see, um, very often they would, they would put into the stories more of the fact-specific stuff than the stuff that we thought was, was really appealing and musical and, and, and we're sure would be appreciated for the beauty of its composition. <laughs> Hard to predict, as I say, but you're always striving for it. Uh, how do you approach keeping a consistent message when the target is changing or when expectations don't live up to what you had initially set? So I'm going to sell something for $40. I'm going to sell it for $40. Well, actually, it's going to cost 60 and that information comes later. As a speechwriter, how do you craft, how do you shape the narrative? Uh, always, it, 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 the general point there would be always allow yourself um, the possibility that the facts on the ground are going to change. You know, if your sales pitch is going to need to change, then there may be there may be something that needs refining in what it is you're selling. But in general, if you if you know that you're in a in a in a, in, a, in a situation that's subject to change through no fault of your own and through no dishonesty of your own. You just have to allow yourself, allow for the fact that, 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 that there could be changes. Uh, don't predict, when we worked for President Bush, I mean, it was, it was a rule. Don't brag on the stock market. Well, the stock market went up. If the president brags on that, it sounds like he's taking credit for it. And if the stock market goes down, you know, well, then what do you do? Then what do you do? Uh, I don't think that, that that rule has been consistently applied, but but in our case, uh, um, you know, it was just just something we were we were you know told not to do and never did. Thank you. You bet. Let me do a question from our Dory now. Um, this question is from Tim. If tasked with writing a speech for President Trump or a character with similar off-the-cuff style, how would you approach the task? How might, might this differ depending on the speech, 
such as State of the Union or charity event? Well, it, it, everything hinges on the nature of the speech. The first question I always have in connection with a speech assignment, other than the obvious information of who's speaking and what the, what the general subject matter is, the first question I ask is, who is the audience? Is it your friends? Is it the unpersuaded? Is it your adversaries? Is, it, is the press there? In most cases, it will be. Uh, is it a political event? Is it a nonpartisan event? I mean, really nonpartisan, like a, uh, you know, a chamber of commerce or something. Is it a building dedication? Is it a funeral? Is it just? Is it a commencement? All these things. I always feel like I'm halfway there if I know precisely the nature of the audience. And so that's the that's the first uh, question I would ask. And if you're writing for someone who does a lot of off the cuff. I mean, you give him some space to do that. Uh, President Bush, we gave him space to do that at the beginning of the speech. He liked to do off-the-cuff acknowledgments and things like that. And then talk to him. The best, the best um, uh, connections between uh, the most successful speech writing uh, stories involve, in, in, in my experience, a real connection between the writer and the person he's writing for. If you just get to know him and can get get to him and can talk to him. I mean, you don't have to be his best friend. You don't want to be in his office all the time. But they've got to, they've got to know the writers. They've got to have some sort of connection because, because writers, if they're not too wrapped up in their own artistry or whatever, your whole job is to learn. And uh, I would also say I've had this conversation with uh, uh, my former colleague, Matthew Scully. Um, uh, one of the great satisfactions of the process I described earlier, the three writers working together, was the satisfaction of producing something really good as part of a team was even better than the satisfaction of producing something really good on your own because you're working with people you like and people you trust and you find that um, you, have, you, you are upholding together a standard of performance and effectiveness that you always want to uphold on your own, but always feel good as well when it's being, uh, when it's part of a common enterprise. And and so, although most writers don't like the idea of writing as part of a, as part of a group, most writers like to write in solitude. I just found uh, that it that it brought one of the great satisfactions of my career being part of a team. That, that had a shared standard of, of, uh, of excellence and performance and, and pride in the, in the common enterprise. And that builds friendships and, and, um, and, and, and long-term associations. The show West Wing glamorized speech writing in a sense. I don't know if you ever watched the show, but there are certain characters who, have, who seem to have a passion for it, even including things like the choice of words and passages. Is this something that you feel is an innate thing? Is, can it be learned? I mean, if you're good at it, can you become great? If you're average, can you become great? Are there, it, you know, yeah. can you say a little bit more about, I mean, it seems to be an art to this thing. Yeah, it, I, I do think that, 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 that it is at, at one level kind of a knack. I mean, um, that is, there are, there are people who just have a natural gift in, 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 uh, in, in writing. Uh, and, and, and I know them and, and, uh, and, and look up to them and admire them very much. It's also a tool you can sharpen. No question. Um, I think uh, uh, you become a better writer by writing. You become a better writer by rewriting. That I know. Uh, you become a better writer by uh, by reading. Uh, I, th I really think that uh, uh, one of the greatest things you can do is just is just be an omnivorous reader because you're going to be drawn to good writing. Uh, if it's if it's something that interests you and it's something in an area uh, that that, um, that 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 you want to know more about an area that's just part of your part of your life it doesn't matter what the subject uh, subject is it just matters that you keep developing your sense of 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 of, of what good writing is just by seeing it uh, 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 you know getting getting to know the quality I, f I find that even now, when I, when I listen to speeches on TV, which I always have done my whole life, 
I'm really struck at how many times you just hear cliches being repeated in set piece speeches. Everybody sprouts cliches in conversation uh, because so much of what we say is just what, what, what's just come to our mind. Uh, but writing is supposed to be something different. Uh, it's thinking. It's, it's, it's thinking things through. It's uh, thinking things from the perspective of not just, not just uh, 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 how, does, how, does, how does this appeal to someone who likes what I'm saying, but how, how is this going to sound to someone uh, who dislikes what I'm saying? And I just I find that when, when I hear strings of cliches, uh, it, it, it sounds to me like, like someone, someone was given the task of writing something but really didn't put any thought or effort into it. I think that uh, it's, I, I always quote David McCullough who said, writing is thinking and thinking is hard, uh, but, but it pays off in just uh, not, not necessarily calling attention to the writing itself, but it, but it pays off when it really calls attention to the point that is being made and the writing is, is, is good and it is conversational, it's unpretentious and therefore the listener likes it, but the listener isn't really thinking about the writing. The, the listener is really thinking about the point being made. That's when you've got something. It looks like maybe we have time for just one more question. OK. Um, so President Bush speaks Spanish. Uh, various presidents have had faculties with other languages besides English in the past, like Kennedy, including German in his speech in Berlin. Uh, at what point does a speechwriter include uh, or think about delivering a speech in a different language, or what are the strategic considerations in including other languages in speeches? Well, um, make sure it's right. Uh, the, uh, I remember poor Hillary Clinton with that reset button. I forget what it meant, but it didn't mean reset. Uh, and and that's, that's just, that's, that's the writer's nightmare, right? Okay, this is, I know what this means. There's, there's an old story that, that you know, that, that Berliner, is actually the word meaning pastry or something, <laughs> and that, and then so that that technically President Kennedy said, "I am a pastry or I'm a jelly <laughs> donut or something." And um, I was at a dinner of former White House speechwriters a few years ago before with Ted Sorensen, who I got to know just through this organization of former White House speechwriters, and he spoke to that directly. He said, "You know, there's a there's a weekly." magazine called The New Yorker. He said, if I stood up and said, I am a New Yorker, no one would interpret, it, would interpret me as saying, I am a weekly magazine. He said, everybody knew what President Kennedy was saying. And it's kind of a cheap shot, you know, years after the fact. Uh, um, but uh, that, I mean, that's the, and it, you gotta get the pronunciation down and everything else. Uh, I remember when I worked for Vice President Quayle, he went to Lithuania right after uh, right after Lithuania was no longer part of the Soviet Union, and he said some things in Lithuanian, and we. But I remember we really went over those and made sure <laughs> we wanted it to sound right, and we wanted to make sure it meant what it was supposed to mean. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for tuning in. It was great to have you.